In order to generate something like a rhetorical matrix of the avant-garde, I will glean terms from four major studies on the subject published along a chronological axis. First, Renato Poggioli's 1962 Theory of the Avant-Garde, where the avant-garde receives its first major theoretical treatment. Then, Peter Berger's Theory of the Avant-Garde, published 20 years later, and still remaining for many the text of reference. Then the peculiar excess of Paul Mounds' theory death of the avant-garde. And finally, a more recent account, John Roberts' 2015 Revolutionary Time in the Avant-Garde. I will note in passing that we will notice a progressive increase in wild theorization, broadening and expansive terminology, and a matrix of meaning that seems to asymptotically approach the infinite, finishing with Roberts' final word. The avant-garde exists as a set of unnamed possibilities. As the first major theoretical treatment of the avant-garde, Renato Poggioli's 1962 study set many of the terms for criticism to come. Poggioli traces a broad historical lineage of the avant-garde, from 19th century romanticism through aestheticism and into the 20th century, arguing that the avant-garde's incessant myth of the new is its defining feature a feature born out of aestheticism's denial of the sacral and ritual function of art. This autonomy produces the conditions of possibility with the military metaphor of being at the front or on advance. If Romanticism was in some sense an organ of public opinion, the avant-garde sets itself apart as an advanced military unit pressing onward in front of society. But Poggioli is quick to point out what will become a recurrent paradox. The conventions of avant-garde art, in a conscious or unconscious way, are directly and rigidly determined by an inverse relation to traditional conventions. For this reason, Poggioli states that any avant-garde lasts only a morning, before its sense of newness is identified as already traditional. Beside this general overview, Poggioli presents a certain matrix of terms that he employs to help draw out what the avant-garde is. Here I've mapped them as a rhetorical diagram. One cannot theorize the avant-garde without coming up with a set of descriptive terms. Or are they constituent elements? If the latter, we must consider that from this general confluence of terminology, the avant-garde itself is a mere epiphenomena of discourse, a point we will return to. Poggioli finds the avant-garde to function along two major axes, the activism-antagonism axis and the agonism-nihilism axis. These are positive and negative polarities. Activism describes a sense of adventure, the myth of the new, and antagonism, the creative social conflict of politics. Here being against is a productive political againstness. The nihilism-agonism axis presents a darker, destructive avant-garde, a more purely destructive without productive bent. Here, agonism represents conflict as such, and nihilism as total annihilation. Other terms of importance for Poggioli are anti-universal, anti-classical, alienation, futurism. Here we've begun to map both the avant-garde, but also the rhetorical and terminological manner by which many studies proceed. While Poggioli's was perhaps the first deep treatment of the avant-garde, Peter Berger's is likely the most influential. It also characterizes what will dominate theoretical treatments of the avant-garde after Poggioli, as it is pervaded by a deep suspicion that the avant-garde project, as typified by the historical avant-garde in the first part of the 20th century, failed. Berger sees the avant-garde of the 50s and 60s, especially in the USA, as a kind of resonant death knell of the avant-garde, little more than a neo-avant-garde, whose very existence proves the avant-garde's failure. For Berger, the intention of the historical avant-garde was the destruction of art as an institution set off in the praxis of life. If, as Poggioli pointed out, art's position as an advanced force was the result of aestheticisms having made the work of art autonomous, free of its sacral and ritual function, for Berger, this autonomy is precisely what the avant-garde sought to destroy. This has come down through criticism as subsuming art into life, or destroying the art-life boundary. According to Berger, it failed. Museums exist, art remains. But it did succeed in one regard, as Berger put it, the social subsystem that is art enters the stage of self-criticism. In other words, the avant-garde presented the autonomy of art as an institution to itself, as an object of critique. The takeaway is not a new avant-garde. Such a thing is a contradiction in terms. 
How could one have an avant-garde tradition? To be always in advance, quote, traditionally? Others will later turn this as an arrear guard, that the neo-avant-gardes are preservers of the tradition rather than colonizers. Regardless, Berger views the avant-garde as ushering in what we might call a type of imminent self-reflexive form of critique that occurs by way of disjunction, collage, chance, collage, and fragments. Unexpected mixtures might unravel the sense of expectancy aesthetic or organic art provides, thus forcing one to interrogate their own ideology and change their life. By 1991, with Paul Mann's blistering critique, The Theory Death of the Avant-Garde, we've reached a stratospheric height of self-reflexive critique that is nothing short of the avant-garde's event horizon. For Mann, the self-reflexive institutional critique presented by Berger leads only in one direction, infinite recuperation, complicity, and, ultimately, toward an unprecedented silence. Splitting off in another direction is the exemplary revolutionary time in the avant-garde by John Roberts, which presents in a most robust and prolix fashion a densely theoretical treatise on the revolutionary time that evades capitalist time as instantiated by the avant-garde. For Roberts and others who want to wrest a specific politics from the avant-garde, the avant-garde is precisely meant to be theorized and re-theorized, becoming for him an open-ended research program that can investigate not just the institution of art, but the epistemological claims of any and all discipline. Theorists like Roberts want to extract from the avant-garde its most advantageous qualities and retroactively re-theorize the 20th century to accommodate them, thus evacuating the avant-garde's excessive generality. For Mann, this re-theorizing is precisely what the avant-garde is. He calls this the white screen of the discursive economy, and we might think of it as an abstraction of Berger's thesis on institutional critique. This is critique twice removed, zombie-like. As Mann writes, the gradual visibility of the discursive economy is the real history of the avant-garde, and ultimately leads to a whiting out of discursive difference. Mann's critique shows in excruciatingly theoretical detail the many ways avant-garde practice has been recuperated into capitalist exchange precisely by being presented in and on the discursive screen we call the avant-garde. Maggie Nelson writes recently of Moton's Consent Not to Be a Single Thing trilogy that Moton makes the activities of reading and thinking feel palpably fresh, weird, and vital. Moton's theoretical writing, I suggest, produces an aesthetic experience of the undetermined orientation. Nelson's experience of euphoria, reading Moton, is my own. A holotropic state of sociality, producing an omnidirectional and cybernetic affect. In the opening chapter of In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, Moton writes of a sentimental avant-garde that ultimately, I would say, is not much of an avant-garde at all, more of an undetermined unpreparedness in improvisation. Writing with, through, and within the music, sound, and poetry of Cecil Taylor, Moton suggests everything in Cecil Taylor is improvisational, more precisely, the improvisation of a notion or phenomenology of the ensemble called, quote, everything. Moton finds in the sentimental avant-gardism of Taylor an effectual condition outside of location, direction, or purpose, an irreducible dehiscence. Readings are generative. The sentimental avant-garde, quote, reveals the occluded of language, sound. In other words, it unfolds the material variety of medium as the experience of an irreducible affect. We move toward a more, quote, general, quote, everything of social, quote, ensemble. This general sociality is, in my mind, in tandem with undetermining the orientation. In other words, it is an opening to rather than an advance beyond. With Moton, I think this affectual sentimental orientation, to be as disarmed as possible, reveals an afterlife of Mon's screen of discourse and the alternative to endlessly resuscitating the, the zombie avant-garde. It is a euphoric determination of effectual choice. Here we subtract what was generally part of the avant-garde all along, the unraveling potential of openness as precondition for change. We cast the avant-garde into a general undetermined orientation of openness. 
Having contended with the term so deeply, it's telling that in consent not to be a single thing, there is almost no avant-garde at all. Well, maybe a little. Along with the work of Fred Moten, I find Johanna Drucker's recent work on the post-language semantic and social field of diagrammatic writing in its own way a version of undetermined orientations. Stochastic poetics sits comfortably between the rigidly constrained and the stochastically undetermined. Stochastic systems are non-deterministic. They emerge in non-linear ways according to chance and contingency. While language is partly a determined system, it is also largely emergent, imminent even. Discovering the emergence of meaning out of language's field is the subject of stochastic poetics. It was entirely handset in letterpress without the rigidity of quadrature. A two-year labor, each page took several trips through the letterpress to make its final impression. Drucker created 39 editions of the book, each entirely unique, the emergent result of her stochastic printing system. The book is bound between two solid plates of beautiful etched aluminum. We notice a distribution across the page of inked and uninked portions. Now, Upon close inspection, it's important to point out the letterpress imprint is visible both haptically and optically. Even sonically, if you were to slide something light across the surface of the page and listen closely, you would hear the texture. The proprioceptive matrix is omnidirectionally engaged. The substrate is, like all language printed on recto verso sides, dually the base in opposing directions. In Moton's language, Every page is an out of the outside of the substrate of the page. We notice some things immediately. There is a page gestalt here, a distribution resembling the graph or distillation of a complex dynamic system, somewhat chaotic. It is perhaps galaxial space, like an allusion to Gerardo de Campos's galaxies. But it is more ineffable than that. The distribution is a somewhat generic version of complex distributions. There are areas of denser clustering and less dense clustering. The gestalt gives us the idea of language without providing a definite sense of reading, though within the gestalt an understanding of reading, a general casting of reading in the Laruelian sense, emerges from the distribution. Indeed, among the distributions we've already noticed patternings, Repetitions of shapes, lines of flight, motions, givings and takings, even superpositions of shapes. Note, for example, a random distribution of S's spread like a constellation across the page, recalling to mind Eugen Gomringer. Perhaps these S's, too, are merely floating debris in a stream, or particles within a gaseous form collecting water vapor around them, amassing a density so that raindrops emerge. Among what presents initially as a kind of formed and formal chaos, we discover emergent syllables in fact, whole words set completely off, lonely galaxies and constellations of meaning. Word and ug repeat. We have man, past, many, vivid. We have the vivid dread of Derridian phallogocentrism, emergent, coterminous with our recognition of the sign. Undercutting this on very close inspection, is the lack of quadrature, revealing meaning itself on the out of the outside of the mechanical formality used to produce it. All sense of regularity always and only in this context, a recognition of our recognition of formality. The squareness of quadrature reveals itself as the conceptual underpinning of the paraphobial comfort we receive in the suturing act of reading. But it is the out outside here, a casting toward the general condition of formality that we merge with in the undetermined reading. The determinate conditions of production themselves are shown to be emergent. The galaxial or cellular particles are perhaps even most of interest, as within the gestalt of the reading moment that vacillates between a reading and a seeing, setting the activities at once apart but more accurately superposed, partial words emerge. History, human, mouth, crossed, paths, scream, syllable, cream, 
poem, wind, minute, evoking senses of time, its pastness, our being within it, out of its being, creaminess, screaminess, the sound of soundless reading, poems themselves, where are they? Also left with types of sonic meanings, slightly more disoriented and undetermined, but patterned, repeated, and even shaped. Here, something like a quasi-quadrilateral visual anagramic rhythm traps the eyes like a textual charybdis, only to be drawn away toward the sea and end swarm, which, as our orientation shifts, so do their identity. Or here, the odd linearity of this swarm as if grouped around a stick of dark matter. Without a sense of regularity in terms of font, point size, or real semantic meaning besides the excitement generated by any and all exclamation points. I want to suggest that on this spread we don't witness anything like an avant-garde.